All right, let's get into the Word of God today. Luke chapter 19 is where we're going to be reading from the story of Zacchaeus. Now, who went to Sunday school? Hands up. Who knows the song? All right, now sing it with me. Now, Zacchaeus was a very little man. He climbed up, up a sycamore tree. You don't know it, do you? <laughs> la, da, 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 da. And when the Savior passed that way, he looked up at the tree. He said, Zacchaeus, you come down right now. I'm going to your house for tea. I'm going to your house for tea. Do you remember it? And that's what we're going to look at today. For all of you on this side, and maybe a few, a few others as well, uh, that's what we used to do in Sunday school. We used to sing Scripture, and that's how we remembered the story in the Bible. So Luke chapter 19, verse 1, it reads like this. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Let's just pause right there. To read the text in the context, you need to know that half a chapter prior to this, Jesus was uh, accosted by another rich young man. A rich young ruler came to Jesus in Luke chapter 18, verse 24, and said to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, you know the commands, live them. And he said, well, I've done that, Jesus. I've done that all my life. He goes, okay, well, one more thing you lack. I want you to sell every single thing you have and come, give that to the poor and come and follow me. I want to be your provider. I want to be your leader. I want to be your guide. I want to be your protector. I want you to give up basically all your control and follow me. And the Bible records in Luke chapter 18, verse 24, that this rich young man was so devastated that Jesus had the nerve to ask him to give up everything. He was so caught up by what he had, he left Jesus very sadly and went. And Jesus gathered his disciples together and he said, it's very hard, it's really hard for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. And all the disciples said, what? Are are, are you serious? Who, Who then can be saved? And Jesus ended in Matthew chapter, Luke chapter 18, verse 27 saying, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so we have here this story just before Jesus meeting Zacchaeus. And he gathers his disciples together and he says, listen, you know, uh, I want you to give up everything to follow me. If you've ever read that scripture, uh, you might be asking yourself, why is Jesus being so hard on this guy? I mean, this guy came to Jesus. This guy has obeyed the word of God. This guy wants to grow in his relationship with Christ. And he comes to Jesus, not Jesus going to him. He comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, how do we get even closer together? And I, and I wonder, you know, Jesus, this, this, you're, being, you're being a little bit hard on the guy. Surely you are asking a man to give up everything. Thank God. Thank God Jesus is not asking us to give up everything, right? Do you know that the command that Jesus gave that rich young man is exactly the same command that he gives to us? Somewhere along the way, we started teaching following Christ is uh, raising your hands and giving your heart to Jesus and, and coming to church and maybe sitting in a Sunday service. But all along, Jesus has actually said, listen, I want everything. I want it all. A servant cannot have two masters. And we're not just talking about money. He literally wants everything. And he has the nerve to ask of it. 
The Bible says that God is, is a jealous God, and He's not interested in 99%, but He literally wants everything. And so he says, Jesus was teaching his disciples. He's going, you know what, guys? Uh, it's, it's, it's hard for a poor person to give up complete control, but they've got a lot less to give up. But for a rich person, man, they've got their safety in their wealth and their materialism. They've got, uh, if something, if God doesn't come through, I've got backup plans. I've got the little savings there. I've got, I've got some things that I can put into place. And God says, it's a lot harder for a rich man to give up complete control and to surrender everything because he has to give up a lot more. And the guys are going, oh my goodness, it, it's impossible. He goes, no, no, no. For man, it's impossible. But when it comes to surrender, God's not asking man to surrender. He wants to come and touch your heart and help you to surrender. He goes, with man, it is impossible to give up everything you put your hope in, everything you built up, everything. You, it's impossible. But I tell you, just one revelation of who God is, one revelation of protector, one revelation of provider, one revelation of the lover of your soul, and all these things begin to change. Because really, when it comes to sacrificing and surrendering your life to Christ, it must be God initiated. It cannot be man that is shaded. So we have that just half a chapter before. And so these guys are thinking, man, rich people have it really hard because they don't want to. And Jesus wants to show them. And he meets up with Zacchaeus. You see, we know through the word that there were so many people that came to Christ or came to salvation through Jesus' ministry. But there's only a few that's been penned for us. And so every single person that comes to salvation through the ministry of Jesus and is written in the Bible, we're supposed to study and we're supposed to learn from that person's life. So what can we learn from this guy, Zacchaeus? We know that he was a rich man. We know that he was a tax collector. And we also know from the scripture that he was extremely uh, interested in this Jesus guy that he had heard about. In verse 3, Zach went, Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was a short man, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore or a fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Verse 6, so he came down, and the Bible adds the words, at once, and welcomed him gladly. So we're getting a picture here that it actually Jesus was not talking about if you're rich, You'll never get into the kingdom of God. Thank God, because most Australians are 95% richer than the rest of the world. So if I were you, I'd be rejoicing. Phew! It's not our bank balance that Jesus is looking at. It's actually a heart. It's actually a heart that says, I want to trust in myself. I want to be Lord of my life. That's what Jesus is actually targeting when he's talking about those who are rich in themselves. You know what? I don't need for God right now. I've got, I'm rich in health. I'm rich in finance. I'm rich in confidence. And if you're rich in yourself, then there's no need for God. But I tell you, those who are poor in spirit, they're the ones that the Lord turns to. Those who realize, you know what? Even with all my wealth, I haven't got Jesus. Even in all my wealth, I haven't got forgiveness. Even in all my wealth, if it wasn't for God's protection, provision, and guidance, I would be lost. And those are the ones that are poor in spirit. And so we go back to this story. This rich man on the outside has this hungry and poor heart. This heart that actually says, hey, Jesus, I come, come. Yeah, sure. Jesus goes out, looks for him, gives him an invitation like Revelations chapter 320. The Bible says, uh, this is Jesus speaking. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And this is exactly what Zacchaeus does. Jesus knocks on the door and says, hey, listen, it's time for relationship. 
And Zacchaeus does it immediately. He opens his heart. He welcomes Jesus in immediately. And that's the point where we often get to uh, where in this place today, at the end of the service, I'm going to give people an opportunity to make their peace with God because Jesus has come for you. He loves you. He wants to give you a fresh start and a new hope. But listen, it goes on from there. So often we stop at this point of invitation and we welcome Christ in. Uh, but what we see here is a lot more. The Spirit of God continues to move on Zacchaeus' life. In verse 7 of Luke chapter 19, all the people saw this and they began to mutter. Mutter, 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 mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, verse 8, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. What a wonderful salvation story. Right there, Jesus is saying, Hey, listen, the rich... The poor Christ came for all of them. He came for those who were lost. He came for those who were broken. What a wonderful salvation story for all of us to realize that no one is too far from the hand of God. No one is too far from the mercy and the grace of God. Jesus Christ came to seek you. He came to save you, regardless of your past, regardless of your history. You are in the right place today because Jesus Christ is looking for you. Jesus Christ gives you that invitation. Why is tax collectors so hated back then? You need to understand the Hebrew culture. The reason these people were so angry with Jesus, uh, and these were some of them weren't just religious leaders, even some of Jesus' own disciples were really angry that Jesus would meet with a tax collector. I mean, they were the lowest of the low. They were ranked with the prostitutes. Imagine Jesus going to a prostitute's house to hang out. Basically, that's what it was like. They were talking and they were muttering. Well, let me explain what a tax collector was. In that day, um, he, uh, Israel was under Roman occupation. And so the, the Roman Empire uh, really had a grip on the nation and, and taxed them heavily. So they weren't free to do what they felt God had called them to do. They weren't free to have the worship that they had. They weren't free to lead the way they wanted to lead. They weren't free at all. And what the Romans would do is they would appoint Hebrew men to be tax collectors, to actually work for the Roman Empire to tax the Hebrew people. So basically, they were uh, people who would turn against their own people, and they would go and uh, using force most times to get the tax for the empire, but also uh, for their own income. And basically the way it worked is there was no real rules and laws as to how much a tax collector was able to, to collect. What he would do is he would collect what was needed for the empire, but he would also, um, depending on who he was speaking to, add his personal cut to it. He would just add just that little bit more. And of course, the richer the tax collector the more he had burnt the people, the more he had taken from the people, the more he had stolen from the people. And so we have in this scripture a really good description of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. He was a Hebrew man that had other, he, he would go and recruit people, turn against your own people. Listen, let's work for these guys. Listen, this is how you get money. So he was a chief tax collector and the Bible records that he was a successful tax collector. He was a rich tax collector. He was a prosperous wealth a tax collector. And in that town, he was probably hated the most. He had to live amongst the people he was using. He had to live amongst the people he had betrayed. He was living amongst the people he had used and manipulated. And now, this great man of God, the Son of God, has come to town and he has gone to lunch with that guy. That guy. You can imagine the disciples, well, I'm not going to have lunch with him. If I go to that guy's house for lunch, my whole family will probably beat me up. 
No way. No way. No, Jesus, Jesus do, you know who, do you know who that guy is? Jesus goes, we're going. And this is why we're going. Because the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. That no one is too far gone for the mercy of God, for the hand of God to come and reach them down. It doesn't matter about your past. The enemy will keep shooting up your past. You are a a liar. You are a cheat. You are an adulterer. You are an abused victim. You are an abuser. Whatever the enemy will put up at you, can I tell you, the Son of Man has come to seek after you. He's come after you, but not to hurt you, not to judge judge you, not to put you in prison for your sin, but to save you because he took the curse. He took your sin upon himself. So the Christians and the religious leaders could not understand why Jesus would do this. But Jesus knew, I'm taking your sin upon myself. I'm taking your shame upon myself. But here's what I want us to focus on today. Verse 8, Zacchaeus speaks up. And says, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. You see, what we're seeing here is salvation working on someone's life. It's so much more church than making a decision for Christ. What we see here is a man being taken over by the purposes of the kingdom of God. It it was more than just a lifting up of a hand. From now on, I guess, you know, if I haven't been shifted on to work on a Sunday, uh, and if I haven't got a party late last night on Saturday night, I'm going to be at church. That's Okay, I'm going to do that. Or, you know what, I'm going to start being a little bit nicer to my mom and my dad. Or I'm going to be a little bit more uh, 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 integral in maybe how I fill out those forms. It's much more than that. It's this process of kingdom invading every area of your life. Zacchaeus didn't leave it at just, cool, I have been forgiven. But he allowed the grace of God to continue on from forgiveness to repentance, to restitution, to reconciliation, and to obedience. We see this man coming from brokenness and full of sin, and then he's forgiven. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't put the Holy Spirit in a box and say, you can only have this much of my life. He actually says, Holy Spirit. You have free reign into every single area of my life. Let me tell you, from this encounter with God, everything I do has to change. That's what he's saying. He goes, listen, my work is going to change. My my relationships with people that I have hurt is going to have to change. Uh, If I've stolen from anybody, my finance is going to have to change because of what he has done in me. Because in here, I am different. In here, I am different. It must be seen out here. There is this process that Christ is on. And it's not just salvation decision, but it leads to discipleship. It leads to maturity. It leads to a life under the obedience of God's Word. This year alone, we've seen over 250 people Give their heart to Jesus. Praise God. That deserves a clap. Come on, let's praise Jesus. That's amazing. But can I tell you, we haven't seen nearly as much in water baptism. And yet, that's one of the first things the Lord commands a disciple. People go, (laughs) yes, my sins are forgiven. I had Jesus come to my house and he met me. He forgave me. Thank you. But Jesus goes, no, no, no. Back to the word. Obedience is the next step. Baptism is the next step. It wasn't a good idea. It was a commandment. But we go, no, 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 Jesus. Holy Spirit, listen, you're asking for a lot. I'm already giving you Sunday mornings. He's going, no, 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 I'm not asking for a lot. I'm asking for everything. The nerve of Jesus to ask you for your entire life. 
the nerve of Jesus to ask you not only for your past, but your present and your future as well. The nerve of Jesus to say, from now, I'm going to be your shepherd, but I'm also going to be your guide. I'm also going to be the driver of your life. I'm going to be everything to you. I'm not interested in 99%. I'm after 100%. You know, when Zach said that, I'm going to give, Zach wasn't trying to earn forgiveness, church. He wasn't going, well, if I'm good enough, maybe God will forgive me. This is after Christ calls him, meets with him, loves him. After all the forgiveness and the love, because Christ loves us while we're sinners, the Bible says. But after he's experienced that, it doesn't stop at those nice feelings of Jesus forgiving me. It goes on. Hey, listen, I need to change. I need to change. So often we celebrate the grace of God to bring us to the point of repentance. But today I want us to celebrate the grace of God that actually highlights the areas of our life that is out of line with God's Word and gives us the strength to change. There's grace too. That's grace too. What a change in this one man's life. I had a a young man lived with us who will remain nameless, and it's not Matthew who is currently living with us, <laughs> just so to protect Maddie. Um, uh, and I've shared this story and shared his name before, so I hope you forget. Um, but uh, he's a good man. He's a man of God. And, uh, but when he came to us, he was a young man, and he didn't know how to do family very well. That's the best way to describe him. So in our house, if you come and live in Chaliaville, you have to cook one, one meal a week. That's just the rules. So you get to pick which day, you get to pick which meal, and at 6 o'clock on that day, uh, we come home, uh, everyone's there, and the meal is ready at 6 o'clock, Matthew. 6 o'clock. Um, it's not the same meal every single week, Zach Pusey. It's... it's um, it's a different meal. So, that, so when they get married, their wives can come and thank us, you know, uh, for, for growing them and stuff like that. So anyway, this young man, uh, when we, he first moved in, I would say, okay, 6 o'clock, yes, I'm going I'm to cook an amazing meal. And 5.30, and he wouldn't be home. And 5.45, he wouldn't be home. 6 o'clock, 6.15, 6.30. I'd ring up around 6.30. I've got a young baby, and I've got a wife. And mostly my stomach was, you know, yelling and screaming. With, where are you, bud? Oh, can't come back today. So sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so. I'm so it will never happen again. First week, second week, third week, and it came to the stage where I just sat him down one day. And I use a, a term that he still uses nowadays as a youth pastor in his own right that he uses with young people. I said, blah, blah. <laughs> I won't mention his name. I don't want to hear sorry. I want change. And at that point, he was like, and I said, I'm serious. If I ever hear sorry again for the same thing and don't see change, you're out. And sometimes I just wonder, I just wonder if God is trying to get a message across to us. Listen, stop with the sorries because true repentance is more than just words. True repentance is a life change. True repentance is, God, I did it wrong. I don't want to do it again. You've pointed it out with your kindness that has led me to repentance. Now give me supernatural strength. Give me supernatural wisdom. Give me supernatural people in my life to help me change. That's what we see with Zacchaeus. It wasn't a guy going, yay, I've been forgiven, but I can still keep living here. No, he's like, man, I have been forgiven, but by the grace of God, I'm going to change. My life is going to change. My lifestyle is going to change. My friendships are going to change. The way I do business has got to change. The kingdom of God must permeate every single strata of my life because I have an encounter with God. 
I've had an encounter with God and it must change because it's changed on the inside. Repentance is so much more than sorry. If this is Zach saying, listen, if, if I live wrongly from there, I'm going to change that right now. If I've stolen from you, I'm, I'm going to give back to you. If I carried business unethically, carried out business unethically, then because of my encounter with Jesus Christ, I am going to get those things correct. Can I ask you, friends, where are you at with this? Where are you at with this? As long, you know, the longer you are a Christian, the more of the bigger stuff, the things that maybe everyone can see and everyone can go, wow, you know, you deal with those sort of things. But what about the smaller things? What about the smaller things? Where are you at with that? Are you allowing your encounter to God, with God to permeate Every one of those things, the way you fill out your Centrelink forms, the way you fill out your tax forms, the way you fill out your reimbursements at work, the way you fill, fill out your, your time logs, are you allowing your encounter to cry with Christ to permeate every single one of those relationships? How about when you're driving? Are you allowing your encounter with God to permeate what you do behind that wheel, or do you just laugh it off and say, <laughs> 99% is good enough? God wants 100%. He wants integrity in every part. He wants integrity with every... If you lost your ability to speak, would your employees look at the way you carry out your business affairs? in a way that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would they say, this guy is definitely a Christian? So important. Title of my sermon, right at the end. Forgiven, yet expected to change. Forgiven, yet expected to change. Because a true encounter with Jesus will permeate every aspect of your life and make you more like Christ. We've been looking at 2 Chronicles 7.14 and it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and then we stop. Yeah, but I, I'm no longer doing all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, but just turn away from your wicked ways. Turn away, Joel Chalaya, from your wicked ways. When that phone, this is my big challenge to me, in the car, I've actually got authority over me that says I shouldn't pick that phone up. But you know what, Jesus, you can have 99.99%, but it's, I just, I just, Confessions. Pastor Nate gives away people's gifts. That's worse. All right? Don't you judge me. All right? I think I received a teal towel or something like that. Don't you judge me. Sharon's going, where is he going with this? <laughs> how, much, how much of the laundry is he going to bring out? We're a transparent church. And, he, and Beck just said, if, if anybody here did give those towels, they're really sorry to give it away. <laughs> no, she didn't say that at all. God is expecting change. Listen, church, God, as the musicians come up and help me, God is expecting change. He, you know, when, when um, the, the lady in uh, John chapter 8 was caught in the midst of adultery and the, the, the punishment for that was death and they brought her out and said, Jesus, this woman here was caught. She is guilty. We've got proof. What are you going to do? Jesus said, listen, if, if there's anyone here without sin, you cast the first stone. They all ran away and left. Jesus didn't go, hey, cool, your sins are forgiven. Go, enjoy. She didn't go, yes, got away that time. Woo! Come on, free! Ooh, that guy's cute. What did Jesus say? Daughter, sin no more. I'm forgiven, yes. But there is an expectation of change now. 
there is an expectation from God that you will change now. He has shown you so much grace. He has shown you His love. His kindness has led you to repentance. But don't now say, you know what? I'm I'm just going to keep this to myself. Jesus, you have the rest of that in my heart. He goes, no, there is forgiveness, but there's also an expectation of change. Those things that you have held on, it's time to let it go. I want you to give it all up for me. I want you to give it all up for me. I want you to give it all up for me. And the rich person says, no, 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 I need that stuff. And he leaves Jesus and he leaves Jesus sad. But today I pray that there would be a church, there would be a people, there would be a marriage, there would be a family that says, no, 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 Jesus, it's going to hurt. I know you're asking for it. I need your grace and your strength to pluck this out of my life. But I want to give it to you. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be healer of my heart. I want you to be the guide. I want you to be protector. Lord means master. If He is master, you are slave. For so long we've been slaves to sin. But we were Lord in our life, we thought. But He says, listen, I've come and I've broken the power of that Lord. But now I'm making you my slave. Do as I say. I want 100%. Yes, you are forgiven, but I'm expecting you to change. Ephesians chapter 4, 22. You were taught, Paul talking to the church, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Stop faking it. Stop faking it. Stop putting church on. Stop putting the mask on, Joel Chaliah. Take off falsehood. Speak. Speak truthfully. Don't even let a white lie come in. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, learn to deal with your anger. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. In other words, learn to forgive. Do not give the devil a foothold. Listen, you can't say, Jesus, have it all except this. You can't. I'll give you everything except that offense. I'm going to make that person pay. I love verse 21. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. And what do we put down as stealing? Oh, that's stealing from other people's property. I would say that's stealing from work. I would say that's stealing from the government. I would say that's stealing from other organizations. I would say that's stealing from your family, what is rightfully theirs. I would say that's stealing young people from your parents, what is rightfully theirs, which is your time and your honor. I would say that's stealing from your wife or your husband what is rightfully theirs, which is your full affection. He says, we're going to deal with it. Listen, don't lift your hands up in worship and not allow my spirit to permeate you, Joel Chaliah, in every single area. I want it all. Wow. Jesus has the nerve to ask for it all. Do you know, every revival was preceded by a cleansing of the church. And in Evan Roberts' revival, the one in the Welsh revival, he said to the people, if you have any ungodly way that you have been giving yourself into, it's time to repent. It's time to lay it at the foot of the altar. And if you're doubtful, I don't know if that is bad or good, he goes, then put that on the altar as well. Because there's no confusion in the Word of God. And often you're saying yes, but it's the Holy Spirit saying no. Do what is right. Stand up for righteousness.